wrote me back in April, inviting me here, and I had to say, well, it's been a long time since I worked on Louis XIV. I haven't kept up on the scholarship. I have actually said no to other invitations. Um, but I could talk about surrender, which is one of the things I've been doing. And he wrote back, and I'm going to quote him so it's a footnote. I have a suggestion. He, I have a suggestion. You could present a kind of ego histoire. Okay. But if you get irritated with my ego and my histoire, il est le coupable. <laughs> J'accuse. <laughs> So this is going to be an ego history. There are two things I need to say at the start. First, I'm a self I am self-consciously a military historian. And second, seeing this as a comparative and cu cumulative field, I've been a vagabond in my choice of projects. In the world of American academia, being a military historian often implies not simply studying combat, but being combative, and at least defensive, a bit of id to go along with the ego. Let me point out that my concept of military history does not include everything associated with the history of war. I take my definition of the field from Alan Millett, a dean of American military history, who narrows it down to, and I think I'm quoting him exactly, the history of military institutions and the conduct of war. This doesn't mean the other things don't matter. In America, it means the other things are taught. I mean, we aren't taught. It's causes and consequences and forget about the conduct of war. So we specialize. I know that the English don't have that sort of separation, and perhaps the French don't as well, but it really matters in America. And in America, the, the military history is a brand of scholarship that has never enjoyed a vogue in at least the American universities. And don't argue with me here, some people have in the past, but they're wrong. I have written quite a bit on this subject, and the embattled state of military history in the United States is so obvious that it's been the subject of articles in major media. For example, the National Review, which is pretty much to the right, the New Republic, pretty much to the left, and the right down the center, U.S. News and Reports, all had articles on the sad state of military history in the American University. So, I feel I'm defending a field when I do anything that I'm doing. I'm trying to show its value. Now, there are those who then have criticized me for being guilty of tunnel vision, that I'm only looking at a certain amount. Well, my first reply to that is that I can multitask. I can be a French historian. I can be a cultural historian, but I'm never not going to be a military historian. Thus, I am obviously a French historian as well, and I feel pretty good about the 17th century through the Napoleonic era. My second reply was that we can't comprehend everything. We all make choices. We all inhabit intellectually confined spaces to one degree or another. And when studying armies, military history is not the worst tunnel shaft to be mining. Moreover, because of a vertical as well as a horizontal expertise, I have a better chance of sensing importance and transition over time. And that's very relevant to, to Giant. Because my work as a whole is more defined by its military theme than by chronological or geographic brownies, I have wandered from era to era and place to place. Like Picasso, I have gone through my periods. From the French Revolution, bayonets of the Republic, to the reign of Louis XIV, giant, the wars of Louis XIV, in a more popularized version called the French Wars, to thematic concentrations on war and culture, battle, which in French is de la guerre, and women's military history, which you didn't mention, uh, in my Women, Armies, and Warfare in Early Modern Europe, a book I'm quite proud of, by the way, because that is actually opening up a new field called women's military history. At present, my primary concerns are the histories of surrender and terrorism, 
with a manuscript on the for, in the former un, underway for Cambridge University Press and another, though terrorist, manuscript for Yale University Press. Given the weight of current events, and I wrote this text three weeks ago, of, <laughs> the history of terrorism is taking precedence Precedents, and in fact, I'll be discussing that in Hervé's seminar on Monday. I've traveled quite a distance since finishing G Giant, nearly 20 years ago, and to tell the truth, when paging through it in preparation for this talk, there were times I hardly recognized it as my own. Sometimes I thought, a real idiot must have written that, and sometimes I thought, well, this guy's really got something going. Well. The last couple of decades of my career is not really germane to this conference, therefore I will stay on target and focus on giant. So when did I become dedicated to the study of military history and how did this dedication lead to giant of the Grand Siècle, the Ego Histoire? Well, it's very fitting. It began while traveling and how prophetic it began in France. At a breakfast table in a little hamlet called Lespinas, in the Dordogne, very close to Les Aizis, in the fall of 1961, when I was 18 years old. I was just getting ready to go to college. I was visiting my sister, and her, she was married uh, to Jim Sackett, who was pursuing his archaeological research on Cro-Magnon Man um, for his PhD at Harvard. And we were sitting around the table, and he asked me what I wanted to do with my life. After, you ask 18-year-olds those kinds of questions, right? And I said, well, um, I, I'm going to be in pre-med, you know, a nice practical feat. I'm going to become a doctor. He said, what do you really like? And I said, military history. And he said, why don't you become a military historian? Well, I had always thought that you had to be an old soldier to write military history, because everything I read was written by old soldiers. And a light went on in my Why not? At 18 years old, I decided I was going to be a military historian. I walked into my advisor's office at the University of Illinois, where I teach now, and I was an undergraduate, and I met my wife there, too. And I said, I'm going to be a military historian. He gave me one of those smiles, you give an idiot, to humor them along. Well, I now have his job. I shouldn't be nasty about him, because he was a very nice man. As an undergraduate in Illinois, I took up the subject of military transformations and political revolutions. That's always been there in my mind. The era of the French Revolution most ex excited me. However, I did go to a summer session at UCLA, and I found myself in a class trot by Andrew Lasky. Now, most of you won't recognize that name, but he was an American specialist on Louis XIV. He only wrote two, two books, but he turned out some wonderful graduate students, including Jeffrey Simcox, whose work on the Navy under Louis XIV I think is wonderful. But at any rate, he drew me to the Grand Siècle, and I could never get it out of my mind, even though I was trying to mainly study a thing that overthrew it. Following graduation from the University of Illinois, my graduate studies took me to the University of California at Berkeley. Now believe me, in 1964, studying military history at the most revolutionary campus in the United States was not an easy thing to do. I, I was a picket captain in the free speech movement, but uh, I wasn't accepted in the coffee houses. But I got the chance to read two critical works that have always stayed with me in the first few months of graduate school. The first is Carlo Cipolla's Guns, Sales, and Empires, The Technological, Innov Technological Innovation and European Expansion, 1400 to 1700. Frankly, I think it's, it's an underread book. I think Jeffrey Parker read it and used it, but did not give it the credit that it really deserved, because he essentially said what we were saying about the military revolution in 1965. Now, I read it in manuscript because I was taking an economic history course with him. So I saw it even before it was in publication. The second thing is I was, I was planning to get the hell out of Berkeley as soon as I could and go to some place could study military history. And the best campus in the United States at that time was at Davis, which was an agricultural branch of the University of California. But Peter Perret was there. And Peter Perret is a brilliant military historian. He would later go on to Stanford and then to the, uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton. 
And he put this article in my hand, and he said, you've got to read this article. And it was The Military Revolution by, by Michael Roberts. So even before leaving Berkeley, I was thinking in terms of radical change. I also got to work with other people at, at uh, Davis. I got to work with Basil Henry Littlehart, who I can't imagine anybody here who knows about, but he was a great interwar th tank theorist and, and a serious military historian. In fact, the first published article I ever did was on the fall of France in 1940, and I can give you the millimeters of armor on a Samoa tank. <laughs> and also Michael Howard. He taught us a seminar for a year. He was, he was in fact, the, the, the professor for, for Parade. He then went on to be a uh, Chichele professor of history of war and ended his career as the Regis professor at Oxford. He was wonderfully knowledgeable, extremely helpful, and he also exemplified to me what I regard as the virtues of historical vagabondage. I remember when, I, when asked to comment on his wonderful book on the Franco-Prussian War, he replied that he had said what he had to say about it in that volume and had moved on. And I feel a little bit in that situation myself right now. From Davis, I transferred to UCLA. I was a vagabond graduate student as well. There, I completed my study with Izzer Wallach, a man of brilliance and fairness. He, went, he left UCLA and spent most of his career at Columbia. He encouraged my interest in French military subjects as long as I shared his in the social history of the revolution. And we got along just fine. And guess what? Back at UCLA, Andrew Lasky. So I didn't take his seminar, but I sat into it. So here I am with these two things going all the time, the French Revolution and the Sun King. Now, in Wallach's seminar, I read two books that would mean a great deal to me. The first was Ernest Lebrus, La Crise de l'Economie Française. And the second was André Corvisier, L'Armée Française. Both volumes took me two weeks to read it. They gave me a sense that you could put data together and come out with hard conclusions. And I fell into the sense that I wanted to write something definitive. I wanted to get the stuff together. I later discovered that is a chimera. The old, the old, the, I, history isn't a product, it's a process. But I had to start somewhere. And in pursuit of my work on the revolution, which I intended to make definitive, I was wonderfully aided by Samuel Scott, you probably don't know, but greatly aided by Jean-Paul Berthaud, a man about whom I cannot say enough good or express enough gratitude. I would not be in this chair without his aid. My dissertation dealt with French infantry tactics, the old column versus line debate. It seemed to be too specialized to become a book. So during my fir first few years teaching at my first big job, which was at University of Maine, I came up with another research project, which has never left me, which was establishing the size and the cost of the French army in order to estimate the amount of money that the French officer corps actually contributed to maintaining the army, a kind of impôt de l'argent to go along with the impôt de sang. I was trying to support the old theory of a noble resurgence prior to the French Revolution, but it's this pr project that led me back in the archives to Louis XIV. The sans culotte in me rebelled against the Sun King, but Louis finally convinced me. Initially, my size and cost project did not go well, as I realized that trying to calculate French, fri French finances despite all the financial projections I could get out of the Archive Nationale, was too convoluted for me to attempt in the time available. It strikes me as a real myth of Sisyphus. So I decided, no, wait a minute. The size figures alone would give me the numbers to say something. And I began simply pursuing them. C'est toujours les chiffres. Now, they had yet to be collected or discounted, as far as I'm concerned, in a systematic way. 
I found that most historians use numbers like they use words, like an exclamation point, as opposed to seriously criticizing the numbers as you went along. And then trying to solve that problem of, yeah, it says it's supposed to be like this, but everybody says it never was like that, but then what was it like? How do you take this and get to this? And thus I began what turned out to be 30 years of periodically trying to get the numbers straight. Hommage à la Brousse et Corvisier. In 1978, it was my immense good forge, fortune to be hired by the University of Illinois. I was back home where my studies had begun. My public presentation as part of the job interview was actually on the military revolution. It wasn't on Louis XIV, excuse me, it wasn't on the French Revolution, it was on the military revolution. And it emphasized military growth. But I had to write a book to get tenure at Illinois. And they made it very clear to me that they were happy I was there, but no book and I'd be out in five years. And the most progress I had towards a book was my dissertation. Isra Wallach gave me very good advice. And I went back to the French Revolution. And I published my first article, though, on size the very year that I started my research on bayonets, again, with the help of Jean-Paul Berthaud. Now, when bayonets came out, it combined data, social theory, and cultural theory. One favorite critique, uh, one favorable critic, excuse me, announced that I had used the methodology of social history to write military history. Hommage à Isar Wallach et Jean-Paul Berthaud. That book was as definitive as any volume I would ever write. I wouldn't change a word of it right now. With the manuscript of bayonets in press, it was time to pay full attention to my inner Louis XIV, and I turned all my attention to the 17th century. Au voir la révolution. The year after bayonets I appeared, appeared, I published an article on French tactical evolution, 1560 to 1660, and also, Jeffrey Parker, the great Jeffrey Parker, you have to say the great in front of Jeffrey Parker, joined our faculty at Illinois. And we had a very unusual thing. We had two experts on early modern military history at a school that didn't want to teach military history. At any rate, he was very supportive of, of my work. And I had somebody to talk to, somebody who was, he was still finishing his military revolution, military innovation and the rise of the West. And so he's interested. And he was a great supporter of my work. He got me a year off in research. He didn't just come. He was a big thing, and he had a lot of resources at his command. And he funded two conferences that I held about military technology and logistics. I'll never be able to repay him. It always seemed to me that the best gauge of the great military transition that occurred under Louis was the growth of the army. It was the numbers again. But my interests expanded beyond that. And as, as I became more invested in the variety of questions, it became increasingly clear to me that there was no single place you could go to that it had all, an introduction to all of the basics of Louis' army. You could for the 18th century. You could for the Revolution. And you could for the World Wars. But you really couldn't for Louis' army. And also, there's no question, the fact that I was now has, uh, had as a colleague uh, a scholar who had written the brilliant The Army of Flanders and the Spanish Road made me think if you could do that sort of thing with Louis' army. From its inception, Giant was intended for a range of audiences with very different backgrounds and very different needs, including military generalists who wanted to get a grasp of what was going on in early modern Europe, and general French historians who wanted a picture of this different aspect of Louis Green. I envision this piece as something for someone to learn sufficient basic information and then to go on. It really was meant to be a beginning and not an end. One reviewer described Giant I think too generously, but said, like an encyclopedia of military law with admirably clear sections on administration, supply, ranks, officer corps, recruitment, morale, and mentality, militias, discipline, oh, battle formations, artillery, drill, logistics, tech, all of that. 
It was indeed meant to be something, as I say, as a reference book. It could not be a grand archival project in every one of its details. That would take several lifetimes. I depended on your lifetimes to finish the book, not me. Writing giant was not an act of arrogance, yet I think it might have been an act of foolishness. But whatever it was, it required a kind of courage. Here you're gonna get into my philosophy of history. Taking on so much meant that it would be deeper in some places than in others, and that I would in all probability come up short on some things that mattered a great deal to other people. Deterred by my earlier experience with the monarchy's accounts and, and directed by my realization that the military side of the army had been neglected by academic scholarships, and of course it fit my general pro profile, I decided to stress the military side. Understandably, there would be those whose paramount issues lay elsewhere, notably in finance and state administration, and they would find fault. So be it. I had to remind myself of what I now counsel all my students, that historical writing should be undertaking with what I call le courage d'être imparfait. This courage is two aspects. The first is to realize you will never write the perfect book. I have known several scholars in my life, and I'll bet you have as well, who seek perfection in their work, either because they're afraid of its possible shortcomings, or they're afraid that critics will point them out as, some, as shortcoming. And in this search for certainty and fallibility, they become paralyzed, or at least they publish, never publish that next great book. The second aspect of this courage is to admit, once you put yourself on record, that you could be wrong. You could be wrong about the great things or the small things. To defend yourself as infallible is the height of fallibility. I do not mean this as an excuse for carelessness or ignorance or stupidity, but only this attitude allowed me to undertake a project that I might have decided was too much for me or maybe too much for anybody. What drew my attention to, to Giant when it appeared, oh, excuse me, what I drew critics' attention to Giant when it appeared in 1997 was probably its ambitious breadth of subject matter and the fact that it received some favorable press, including reviews in the Times Literary Supplement, Annales and Histoire from the likes of Roger Medham, Jean Chagnon, and Joel Cornett. It was even well received by William Bike. However, there were caustic reviews as well, and some of the criticisms there were valid particularly from the point of view of the people who made them. I was a bit stung by some of the negative comments. Mais courage, mon vieux, right? In the greatest politeness, Jean Chagnot reflected some of the book's shortcomings when he compared it to Parker's superb The Army of Flanders and the Spanish Road. Chagnot called, Chagnot called Giant more ambitious but in, in its realization, for that very reason, un peu moins impeccable. Well, I plead guilty to much greater faults than being simply un peu moins impeccable. Well, I have no intention of wasting my time defending uh, my, my detractors. Besides, my greatest detractor has already left the room. <laughs> and by the way, I've had a great time with him. One of the marvelous things about conferences is you get together face to face with people you've only been page to page with. Okay. And it turns out you get along quite, quite well. So thank you, you have ended a war. This is a peace treaty during this conference. In the, um, in the wars of Louis XIV, I stated that giant and wars were two volumes of a projected trilogy, and the third would concentrate on war and state formation. I believe that perhaps the greatest scholarly decision I ever made in my life was to write Giant. And the second greatest was not to write the third book, because there were people coming out with far better work than I would have turned out, including David Parrott and Guy Rowlands. I recognized from the start that if successful, Giant could have a very short half-life, as they say in the nuclear world. Remember what I said, and I was damn serious. Ultimately, if this book is successful, it will stimulate the studies that will make it obsolete in the future. 
it is scholarship on a suicide mission. However, that's too grand a statement, because Giant hardly deserves the credit for what was published after it, since much of that was already underway before Giant appeared. And who can say why some scholar took up this project or not? I can only explain my own interest, this is what this paper is about. From conception to completion, research and writing on Giant consumed about a decade. And along the way, I learned a lot on matters I thought I already understood, and certainly even more about those I was unaware of at the start. Consider the issue that so occupied my mind since the 1970s, army size, first in gaining perspective on the French Revolution, and then as a measure of military change under Louis XIV. Collecting materials for Giant, I now found new documents in the Archive Nationale, the Bibliothèque Nationale, and of course, in the stables over there <laughs> where the archive used to be. And as you probably know, I found Parisian and provincial documents that allowed me to propose discounted estimates, folks, estimates, of actual troop strength. In fact, you know, it was Jeffrey Parker who told me, you've got to go to the provinces. You can't stay in Paris. And I will be eternally grateful to him for that. Now, I have to also say that I got it wrong to a degree. So if you want my real up-to-date figures on size, you have to look at a 2006 publication from a 2005 meeting at uh, Madrid. But instead of me being too exaggerated, I wasn't exaggerated enough. Let me tell you the story. While I was writing I requested material from James Wood, it's author of The King's Army, a wonderful book about, about the Royal Army. And he didn't just give me advice, he sent me documents that I could use. Now he didn't give me all his riches, he shouldn't have, he hadn't published his book yet. But he pointed it out that just counting peak army size wasn't going to get me anywhere because the army, royal army he was studying was a temporary affair. It could be raised quickly and then collapse quickly. I had to think about more. And so another light went on. I needed to put French army troop strength in the context of an evolution in the quality as well as in the quantity and the change in quality would make the change in quantity seem all the more impressive. The result of that revelation was the most art important article I have ever written, The Evolution of Army Style in the Modern West, 800 to 2000. It was an absolute spin-off of Giant and then found its way back into Giant as in one of the chapters of the book. The influence of that article on historical studies and in political science has been gratifying, even extending to the just published study of mercenaries fighting for a living, edited by Eric Jan Zerker, uh, something that some of you might want to look up. It just came out a year ago, a project done under the aegis of the International Institute of Social History. And in defense of my particular kind of, of tunnel vision, my typology of the stages of evolution required a knowledge, I would say deep knowledge, of the history of armed forces over time, a kind of knowledge that makes comparative judgments solid. In this case, a tunnel can become a kind of core sample through history from which you can judge change. May I note the article also benefited from extensive discussions with other uh, historians, including, for example, Clifford Rogers, who suggested the medieval stipendiary army and argued for it to me and convinced me it had to be part of it all. Collaboration. In reality, my work is virtually always collaborative. Now let me get back to that Madrid stuff. So we've added the quality to the quantity. Now we've got to look at the quantity. I learned a lot from Woods's book when it came out in 2002, okay? Then from Parrott's book on the, on the Army of Richelieu in 2001. And then I had to reinterpret a critical document 
suggested by Jamel Ostwald's insistence that the French army reached its peak in the Nine Years' War in 1693, not in 1696. I had found a wonderful document, which I would be glad to share with anybody, because I'm not writing on it anymore, and I had misread it. I had misread it, and it was just stupid. So, to make everything short, I had said in Giant that the base number for the Army in the Thirty Years' War was about 125,000, an older figure. Parrott argues very strong for 80,000, and I have to add about 10,000 for garrisons, because he said they were inconsiderable, and garrisons are usually more considerable than you think. And by recalculating this stuff in the way that Jamel insisted I ought to be doing, I raised the maximum size from 340, this is the estimate of the real size, to 360. Guess what? That increased the growth of the French army from 270% to 450%. And then Jean Chagnot wrote in his Guerre et Société à l'époque moderne, what gives Professor Lynn the right? to so discount the army. And we had a wonderful exchange of letters on this. Again, collaboration. Well, I still disagree with him. But he believes that so many of my figures of troops on the road came from April, that the army was, those units were probably larger when the campaign system started, which would even make the growth greater. So folks, you got a tiger by the tail with the army of Louis XIV. It is twice the increase in the army that the French Revolution brought in Turtopeka, easily twice. It's really only matched by the expansion of the French army between the Franco-Prussian War and the onset of World War I. And think about that. Now, there are people who say, there's no military revolution. Then how the hell did that happen? I mean, how did an army increase by 450%. I mean, that's a revolution in itself. Now, I don't buy the packaged histories of, of the military revolution, but you're handling a huge military transition, and then you look at the details, and it's even more. As you guess, I get enthusiastic about things. Returning giant self, to giant itself, well, I don't want to catalog too many of its findings. Some of the most interesting things I found in there were changes in rather technical kinds of innovations, changes in artillery with the Nouvelle Invention. And the reason that caught my eye is there's the Gribouval system a hundred years before Gribouval, and the French use it and turn it down. What struck me is culturally they thought of war in a certain way. And in that idea, which was very much influenced by positional warfare, siege warfare, the older style gun was more effective. It was longer, it didn't jump around so much, and it could handle the constant use that would be required in a siege war. And I could talk about other things, and I will not, okay? I will say another thing. Although I was consciously trying to sidestep the details of finance, it struck me, something that I was saying from the floor here earlier today, that. Let's see, let me step back once. One of the things that struck me is the army changes incredibly, and really the state doesn't. It changes, but it's not like a one-to-one -one thing. Why? And what I would argue is it's because it wasn't just the central government that was financing the army, and that's why I brought up the question to Guy Rollins today. I thought his paper, by the way, was marvelous. Because it was a cobbled together system of financing an army. Therefore, it didn't all fall on the Paris government. You had, yes, the, the, the resources of central government. You had municipal and provincial resources. You had officers contributing serious money, okay, to the upkeep of their own units. And you had war taxes, contributions raised in the field. 
And I'm very happy that that caught the, notion, the, the notice of some people, particularly William Bike, and I'm not gonna read you his comments because I've extemporized a little bit and I'm gonna catch up here. Since we are here talking about Louis and his wars, let me say a bit about the second book as well as Giant, although I was asked to mainly comment on Giant. The Wars of Louis XIV. I did not set out to write The Wars of Louis XIV. It was a book that assaulted me. Um, Hamish Scott, who was the uh, editor of, along with Bruce Collins, of the Longman and now Ruchless series on modern wars and perspective, came to me and asked me would I write the book. Uh, and I decided it would, I was not qualified. I said to him, you really need an expert like my mentor, uh, Andrew Lasky, somebody who was really expert in international relations. He wouldn't take no for an answer. So I said to him, okay, I'll do it. It sounds intriguing, but you better read every page of everything and have John Rule from Ohio State read everything. These are two great experts in the field. So I don't make a fool of myself talking about diplomacy. And believe me, they gave me some comments. As was the case with Giant, Wars of Louis XIV was the first book on the subject, at least the first comprehensive study to appear in 200 years, which I think is the only one. It had to be even more synthetic. The thought of doing archival research on every battle, every siege, every negotiation was obviously out of the question. And neither was it necessary given the, given the intended audience. But I found the overview of it all to be fascinating and another education for me as well. One thing is, it made me look at navies, and I've spent my entire life trying to keep my feet dry, and I had a look at navies, and I found it fascinating. And I argued in it, in the, for the in, French Navy, its, really, its real roar was as, as a kind of amphibious navy to be used in conjunction with the army. Now it also does other things, but sieges of seaports like Barcelona and maintaining the logistic lines, yes. The other thing was war, war as process. I'm still convinced that's a good concept. War as process, as you may know, I, I characterize it as being indecisive battles and sieges, slow tempo of operations, strong resolve to make war feed, feed war, the powerful influence of attrition and considerable emphasis giving ongoing diplomatic negotiations during the conflict. The discussion of Louis' actions after the Dutch War as defensive, but badly played was already there. By the way, I just realized that by flipping my pages, I got you lost. Okay, well, we're on the, you know, it's about a page further on, okay? We're talking about the Dutch War. I think it only appears on that one page, okay? The other thing that I think was critical to the book is the notion of Louis' policy as becoming defensive after the Dutch War. Now, I know that's debatable. Okay? And I'm willing to listen to the debate. But to me, it explains a lot. And frankly, using the social theory of the prospect theory, which talks about one's reactions about, one, one, uh, about the value one gives to things one has as being greater than the value one attributes to things you don't have may, but may want, is really interesting. And by, the guy, by the way, the, the, the guy who wrote that pr uh, theory got a Nobel Prize for it. But there's no question. Trying to deal with everything like that in 400 pages guaranteed that my work would be un, un peu moins impeccable and no better than that. I certainly expect that we and others like us continue to examine the world, wars of Louis XIV. And I'd like to suggest two studies. One would be a study of that, that notion at the beginning of a war that this is going to be a short war. It comes back again and again. Louis is certainly guilty of it. But so are the Americans in the American Civil War. So are the parties to World War I, and so was the US when we invaded Iraq in 2003. Now, I actually find it a particularly odd in an era of what I have called war's process for Louis to be thinking about the next one's really going to be short. But I really think that would make a great project on expectation and reality not just in the wars of Louis XIV, but they would have to use the wars of Louis XIV as an example. I also think, and, and I didn't get this really seared into me until I wrote the book on women. 
And one of them was a French woman who served in Louis's army, masqueraded as a man, from 1690 to about 1696. Her name was Marie Magdalene Muron. I also wonder if the French army helped create a mentality of France, not French nationalism, but a sense that there was something that was France. First, as the army ceased to prey on French people and become a as a source of substance and compensation, and instead took the role of defenders of the frontier, the army exemplified a more de de benign and positive French regime, and that's why I was applauding your papers so much. But even more so, I wonder what it might have been the long-term implications of bringing so many Bourbon subjects into military service as this army just exploded in size. And in doing so, compelled them to travel across the length and breadth of France with their regiments. My wife, Andrea, and I physically traced the travels of this Marie Magdalene Muron. She was born in Picardy. She enlisted in Montreuil, marched with her regiment down to Cisteron. From, at that point, for reasons we don't quite understand, she was released from her regiment, went to Avignon, signed up as a dragoon, went to Rosas and, to, and took part in the siege of Rosas, garrisoned in Collieu at the end of that year, 1693, fought a duel when it was wounded so badly, she had to go see the regimental surgeon, and voila, <laughs> elle est femme. Oh, but that wasn't the end of it. Somehow, and I would love to be able to fill this in, she got back up to saint omer by 1696, where she signed up for another regiment. The sad thing is, that as she aged, I'm sure she couldn't play the convincing teenager that she would have had to, to be, yeah, but she loved the army. So she deserted because, she, because guys were starting to talk about it. Hey, that's really a woman. She hitchhiked, as it were, to air, tried to sign up again, and was, she, big mistake. She took off the regimental coat and jacket, but she had, the, the, the pants on, and it was a little too suspicious, and she was then arrested, and we have her procès verbal. It's a wonderful document. It was filed in the wrong box. Somebody over there messed up. It was in a general book on desertion, and so I was the first one to see the record. I, the note said, uh, we know what to do if a man deserts, but what does a, will you do when a woman deserts? Well, I know what I did. I ran right to the Xerox machine. <laughs> This was a gold mine, and I published that article, an article on that in, in, in 1990. Think about it. If we, someone wanted to trace where regiments went, and you can do that by looking at, at, at the statement of, of, of what regiment was in what garrison, and what regiment was in the order of battle in what battle. You could put together a kind of average itinerary of a French soldier. And think, now not every French soldier got home, true, but the army is huge. And those people go home and they talk to the people in their village. Remember, a big army has to demobilize at the end of the war. You know, it used to say in these things, once you were a soldier, you were always a soldier. Damn, no, you weren't you didn't keep the army that big. That's why you, one of the reasons you need to get that contrast between peacetime and wartime army. But at any rate, you could put together a speculative piece about the army as being a foundation of the concept of a France and eventually of a French nationalism. That's a hell of a project for somebody to take up. Well, I am truly wandering myself now, and I will bring this to a close. You can all applaud. Um, as evidence that it is not simply us in this room who, have, who recognize the importance of French military change, let me tell you about the new West Point history of warfare. This is a watershed project directed by the United States Military Academy at West Point. 
This is a radically new textbook meant for the cadets, but it'll be available to everybody. It's entirely electronic. The cadets now must have an iPad, and it's designed for them to pull up on the iPad. Every chapter is an app, as they say. It means you can change the details, you can eliminate the chapter, you can do all kinds of things without having to reprint an entire thing. The maps move. The illustrations are gloriously in color. In mine, there's a whole bunch of scenes of the ceiling of the, of the, uh, of the uh, a a gallery of mirrors. And they were pretty careful in, in choosing the authors. Uh, yes, I was chosen, but so was Jamel back there. And there are three chapters on the wars of Louis XIV. And mine is all about the evolution of the army. And that wasn't because I insisted. It was because the editors insisted that we had to in introduce American military officers to the history of the army's evolution under Louis XIV. So we in this room seem to make, have made a point about the importance of that giant of the Grand Siècle, a grand creation and a grand collaboration. Thank you very much.